Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video, or if you're new here, welcome to my channel. So the case that I have for you all today is a very recent and ongoing case that I've been following for a few weeks now, but I think we finally have enough information to make a video on this case and share these awful details with you. I also want to mention that this case is another international case out of Malta this time, but because of that, a lot of the information that I have is from translated sources, and I will say that this one, more than a lot of other cases, things were stated a little bit oddly, so I tried my best to interpret it as accurately as I can. But with that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the tragic murder of Palin Kaya. Palin Kaya was born in Turkey in 1993, and she was the youngest of three daughters. She was described as being very close with her two older sisters who made sure to protect their baby sister. She was also known to be very close with her mother and her father. Palin went on to study at Istanbul University in Turkey, where she pursued her degree in architecture within the Department of Industrial Design. After that, she went on to design for Nike in Istanbul. After that, Palin left Turkey and moved to Malta to study English because she thought that learning English could help further develop her career. While in Malta studying English, she absolutely fell in love with the country and decided to move there permanently and establish her life there. Palin loved going to Maltese beaches, with her favorite being Riviera. Her favorite thing to do was to watch the sunsets. She was also very passionate about her career, especially design. While in Malta, she went on to work as an interior designer. Palin's family described her as kind-hearted, intelligent, and ambitious. Her sister said that she would help anybody who needed it. She would uplift people at their lowest, and her family said that she would give them support even when they didn't know they needed it. She was humble, brave, and full of talent. Her parents went on to describe that Palin had always wanted to design a dream home in Turkey for her family. She said that she wanted to design a house in Ardahan in Turkey for all of her families to gather at least once a year. Now, Palin's parents had some complex medical issues that made it difficult for them to visit her in Malta, so of course, while living there, she still went home to visit her family in Turkey whenever she could. Her family describes that after living in Malta for about a year, she visited for about 10 days over Christmas. And there, they asked her if she would ever consider moving back to Turkey. They all missed her so much and they wanted her to come home. But she said that she loved living in Malta. She built herself a strong community of friends and peers that loved her. She had been working for a company called 1% as an interior designer, and there she grew very close to the people that she worked with. Her coworkers described that she was one of the kindest people you could know. She always brought good energy to work, and she was always showing up with a smile. One coworker said, quote, she brought love and happiness every time she walked into work in the morning. I was always looking forward to work and to spend the day with her. She also told her family that she felt very safe in Malta. She loved Malta and all the Maltese people because they made her feel accepted. They were all so kind to her. So even though her family didn't love all of the distance that they had between them, they still supported her in her decision to stay in Malta and build her life there because she was so happy to be there. After two years of studying, Palin did end up completing her degree in English. Now, on January 16th, 2023, Palin and some friends decided to go out for Palin's 30th birthday to celebrate. Palin and a few friends got together, they had some dinner, and ate some cake. The cake was decorated with purple frosting with a photo from the three women from the 90s sitcom Friends wearing a wedding dress with the words Why God Why written on it.
After about an hour of spending time with her friends at around midnight to 1 a.m., Palin started walking home from the restaurant that they were at in Zira. At that point, she was on her way to meeting up with her boyfriend, who she was going to continue celebrating her birthday with. However, as she was walking on the sidewalk of Terrace de Frida Street, I am so sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, out of completely nowhere, as she was walking in front of a Paul and Rocco petrol station, Palin was struck by a car. She was struck by a black BMW X6 and she was flung into the air, flying several meters before falling to the ground. The car then continued going before crashing into the front windows of a KFC restaurant that was right next door. According to witnesses, the man who was driving the car then got out of the car and then ran across the street and picked up bricks and rocks and other rubble and started throwing them at Pei Lin, screaming F you at her as she laid unconscious and unmoving on the ground. At the same time, there was a man in a car who was passing by who saw that this man was throwing things at this victim who was just laying there. So, the man in the car started throwing rocks at this man who actually caught the rock and started throwing them once again at Pei Lin. He also continued throwing rocks at other witnesses at the scene who were attempting to stop him. As all of this was happening, there was an employee of a nearby pastry shop who was sitting outside of the shop when he saw the car heading directly towards the KFC where it ultimately crashed. He said that he saw the man get out of the car and saw him pelting Pei Lin with these rocks. After that, this man looked at the witness and made a beeline, as it was described, towards him. He then struck the employee in the neck with such force that this employee was knocked down. Once this witness was on the ground, the man started kicking him. As this was happening, another witness who was driving by pulled over and got out of the car to help this man who was being beat, but as soon as he tried intervening, this man also punched the driver. But then there was one other witness, an additional man, who came up to help the other man and he was actually able to punch this man and knock him to the ground to get him to stop beating this employee. Witnesses described that everybody in the area was terrified of this man. They all saw him just drive up, hit this young woman, crash into the KFC, throw rocks at her, and then start intimidating and hitting other people in the area. It was described almost like a field of sheep. If this man walked towards anybody or a group, the group would immediately back up and they were all very scared of him. By this point, police arrived to the scene and they described the scene as being absolute chaos. They saw a BMW lodged in the front of a KFC outlet with rubble and debris strewn all over the area. As police were showing up, the man continued yelling to those around him saying, watch me fight the police. Police started yelling to the man to calm down multiple times, but he just wouldn't. He continued threatening to fight the police and he was standing in a boxer's stance, ready to punch whoever came near him. Finally, police ended up having to tase him in order to get him into cuffs and subdue him enough to arrest him. But even after he was cuffed and he was arrested, he continued threatening the police. He told one officer to be careful because he has very sharp teeth, then he told another officer that he was memorizing his face so that he could find him once again once this was all over. Then he asked the police, where is TVM? I want to be famous. TVM is Malta's public news outlet, so he was looking for the reporters so that he could be famous. The whole situation of this arrest was captured on video taken by a bystander. If I can include it, I will include it here. Otherwise, if it's, you know, bound to copyright or whatever, I will include it down below. Oh, 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 oh,
As that was all happening, of course, paramedics started to arrive to the scene to lend help to this victim who had been struck by the car. When the ambulances first arrived, first responders described that the victim was laying face down in the street. She was absolutely covered in blood, so much so that the first responders couldn't tell if this victim was a male or female. As first responders were attempting to save the life of the victim, Palin's boyfriend, who had been walking towards this direction to meet up with her, walked up on this chaotic scene. The roads were closed and he couldn't see what was going on, so he asked an officer what had happened. He told the officer that he wasn't able to reach his girlfriend, so he tried calling her again. As he was calling her, that is when he saw that her phone was lying on the ground and it started ringing. That is when he realized that she was the victim who had been struck by the car. Upon searching the scene, police found that there were various items that were used to throw at Palin and other victims. They also found her white shoes several meters away from where Palin was lying on the ground. Of course, Palin was taken into an ambulance and brought to the hospital. However, by the time she got there, she had lost too much blood. So, despite their best efforts at saving Palin, she was pronounced dead at the hospital by 2.30 a.m., about an hour and a half after she was struck. After being arrested, the man who caused this entire thing was identified as 33-year-old Jeremy Calamiri, who we will discuss in just a few minutes. Police went on to describe their interaction with him at the scene, and they said that this just was not how a normal person acted. They could tell that he was under the influence of something, so, he was arrested and taken in, and he was asked if he had been under the influence, and that is when he told officers that he had consumed cocaine and marijuana that day. So, because of this, he was taken to the hospital for his own treatment. At the hospital, staff reported that he told the doctors that he wanted to hurt someone. He apparently asked the doctor what was the worst thing that had ever happened in Malta because he wanted to do something that would make him famous. He also tested positive for having very large amounts of cocaine and alcohol in his system. So, after this incident, of course, police went ahead with their investigation into how this entire thing happened. They started by gathering CCTV footage of Jeremy's movements that day, as well as the path that Palin would have used to walk home. So first, they went to his residence, which is in the area of Leah. They first saw him leave his home at around 8 p.m. that night, returning back shortly after. By 12.54 a.m., he then left his residence once again, taking his mother's black BMW. He drives for eight minutes from his home in Leah, heading towards Zira. Then he is seen driving on a road doing about 76 kilometers per hour in a 60 kilometer per hour zone. Then he is seen driving at a moderate speed on the road where Palin was walking. He was initially driving straight before he is seen changing directions and then driving directly into Palin, striking her, causing her to be flung into the air and die. It was said that he drove up from behind her, so she never even saw him coming. Then, of course, the CCTV footage caught him crashing into the KFC and then getting out of his car and act the way that we described just a few minutes ago. So, his behaviors were reported by witnesses, but they were confirmed with CCTV footage who saw him throwing the rocks, hitting witnesses, and threatening people and police and all of that. So, because of the fact that he is seen clearly changing directions and driving directly into Pei Lin, he was charged with intentional homicide. After finding all of this out, obviously police wondered if there was a motive, if he had any sort of reason for intentionally hitting her. But after talking to all of those who knew Pei Lin, everybody said that she did not know him. 
and after reviewing CCTV footage and any other information that they could find, investigators came to the conclusion that the two had not known each other, nor had they ever interacted before the time of this crash. She was a totally random victim who was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. After finding this out, police continued their investigation to find out more about this man who committed this totally random and atrocious act of violence. So, after reviewing the CCTV footage, police went to his residence to take a look at his phone. But when they got to his residence, police say that the conditions of his home were just horrific. His home was found to be in a state of extreme neglect, with investigators even describing the state of his apartment as frightening. The detective who went there described seeing several dead mice on the ground, as well as live mice and rats running all over the place. There were also human feces smeared all over the floor, and the toilet was overflowing. Then they were able to find Jeremy's phone lying on the couch, which police searched, but on this phone, they didn't find anything of use. But they did end up talking to Jeremy's then-girlfriend, who told the police something very shocking. She told the police that the pair had an argument on January 17th in the early morning hours. After the argument, he sent her a voice message saying that he is a psychopath and a proud criminal, and that she was going to be hearing about him in the news the following day. Another witness close to Jeremy said that Jeremy had bragged to them about how he was going to kill someone because it was going to make him famous. Now I want to talk a little bit more about who exactly Jeremy Calamari is. So, Jeremy was born in Talau, France, but he was living in Lea, Malta at the time of this crime. And to no surprise, he did have a few brushes with the law, some of which, though, are not made public, so we don't know the full extent of his criminal history, but from what I understand, it does seem like he had a relatively extensive criminal history. So, back in 2012, Jeremy was convicted of damaging a neighbor's property, and for this, he was sentenced to one year in prison and, I believe, one year of probation. Then, about two weeks before the incident, he pled guilty to petty theft from a health food store. In this incident, the court decided that they were going to give him one more chance to clean up his act, so he was put on a three-year probation order. So the fact that they said, like, hey, we're going to give you another chance to clean up your act, that's what makes me think that he had more brushes with the law besides just this petty theft. Those in the neighborhood where Jeremy lived said that he is actually quite notorious in the area. He is known for shouting at his mother and verbally abusing her in the streets where they live. Just all around, he is known for his bad behavior, his violent outbursts, usually directed at his mother. Then, that previous November, there was a situation where someone had actually thrown a small explosive device into the home where Jeremy lived, and it did go off, but in this incident, nobody was hurt. So, we don't know exactly who threw this explosive device into his home, but clearly, once again, it kind of shows that he was involved with people and things that probably were not the greatest. So, as of right now, Jeremy has appeared in court with charges of willful homicide, grievous bodily harm that caused death, grievously injuring another woman, slightly injuring a man, willful damage to third-party property, driving in a reckless, negligent, or dangerous manner, driving under the influence of drugs or alcohol, cocaine possession, as well as possession of another drug, diazepam. He is also charged with resisting arrest, disobeying police orders, using force against others, willfully disturbing the peace, and violating his probation. The full list of his charges is actually about four pages long, and I haven't been able to find those four pages, but as we can see, he's in trouble for a lot of things. At the first hearing, Jeremy pleaded not guilty, I believe, to all charges. His lawyer now claims that he had previously been receiving psychiatric care and was requesting another psych evaluation to determine his current mental state, though the courts do believe that he is perfectly capable of standing trial. They also denied the request for Jeremy to be sent back to the hospital for continued psychiatric care. Instead, he will stay in jail, receiving his medications on a weekly basis. Her family also flew in from Turkey and appeared at the hearing, who were, of course, just absolutely devastated at this entire situation. 
They wanted everybody to know that this was no accident. This was an intentional violent murder. All of the evidence that was being read for the court, her mother could be seen crying uncontrollably in the back of the courtroom. The judge also addressed the court to talk about how devastating it is that a society is seeing another life being taken as a result of drug use. He said, quote, Today we are suffering the consequences of those who want us to celebrate with cocaine and other substances. Let's not get away with the culture that you're not normal if you don't take coke at a party. Life is precious. It's useless to protest when we have a victim and then remain silent. Obviously, you can tell that that's a little bit jumbled up. Um, it doesn't make total sense. It's not perfect English, but I believe it was translated. So take with that what you will. Basically, I think what he's saying is that it's horrible that drugs are being done and that drugs are causing people to act in ways that normally they wouldn't. And that's sort of, I think, what he's attributing to the behaviors that caused this crime. But to that, the prosecutor said that this was not an accident caused by drugs. It was a vicious, intentional homicide. Maybe drugs played a role in his behavior that night, but he always had these feelings that he wanted to kill somebody and that is very obvious. As of right now, that is all we know about this case. As I stated before, this is a very recent and ongoing case and as far as I know, we don't even know when the trial is going to be or anything like that. All we know is the information that I have presented to you but I do think it's obvious what happened here. I think that this is a man who clearly is messed up in the head. He clearly had some sort of mental issues or narcissistic personality traits or whatever to make him think that he was above everybody else. Because I really do think that he planned to kill someone as he told everybody around him. I think maybe this fight with his girlfriend caused him to spin out of control, so he did a bunch of cocaine, and then he decided that he was going to act on the sick fantasies that he had always had of killing someone. Maybe, you know, he was feeling like a nobody. Maybe he was feeling like nobody was appreciating him, so he decided that he was going to act out and do something that would make him famous. And I do think that he did spot Palin and hit her on purpose. We can see that he's just so full of hate and disgust for other people that killing her wasn't enough. He had to get out of his car and further degrade her by throwing bricks and rocks at her, at somebody who he didn't even know. I think that he was in such a rage that there was this moment where everybody and anybody who tried to stop him was a threat that he felt he needed to eliminate, hence him punching and fighting and throwing things at everybody around him. This is one of those cases that just makes you scared of everybody around you. It's one of those cases where you don't want to think people like this exist. People who will just see a victim and decide to randomly act on whatever it is in their head telling them to do these horrible things, but they exist and it's absolutely terrifying. People with just this hatred in their heart who will take it out on anybody and everybody. He clearly didn't think much of himself, as we can see from his living situation. And honestly, going back to that, I really don't know what to make of that whole thing, but I do believe he lived with his mother, either that or he lived in an apartment next to his mother. I don't really know, but clearly he didn't take care of himself. He didn't take care of his living situation. I think that's someone who really does not think much of themselves if they're really willing to live in a situation like that apartment or house or wherever he lived. I almost didn't want to cover this case because I didn't want to feed into the ego of somebody who clearly did this for attention, but I did still want to tell Palin's story, so that is why I decided to cover her case. I want to do international cases more often because, of course, cases like this in areas like Malta just aren't covered as much because obviously people don't hear about them as often. So I wanted to make sure I got Palin's story out there. Obviously, I'm not spending too much time on Jeremy after this. He's not going to be in the thumbnail. He's not going to be featured anywhere. I will put his picture in so you know what he looks like, but otherwise, I don't want to give him more attention. I don't care about him. I don't care about his life. I don't care about anything else that he's done. All I care is that Palin was victimized for absolutely no reason. It's just so, so very sad and devastating that a beautiful young woman with so much potential lost her life, let alone on her birthday, in such a violent and horrific way for absolutely no reason at all. 
literally for walking down the street and being in the wrong place at the wrong time. But either way, that is all I have for today's video. Of course, my heart goes out to Paylin and her family, and I really hope that this case can, you know, get through the court system very quickly so that her family can just go back to their lives and find peace and move on from this horrible, horrible, horrible thing that happened to their loved one. I hope that Jeremy rots in jail for the rest of his life and that after this, nobody talks about him ever again and that he has to live with what he did, that he murdered somebody so viciously all because he needed a little bit of attention. It's, it's appalling. But either way, that is where I am going to end today's video. If you liked today's video, please make sure to go ahead and leave it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send the suggestions over to my Google form, which will be listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!